Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you very much for coming to our presentation today on the motion support animals. Um, and you kind of a, a basic guide to navigating this new landscape that's kind of come up in our recent history um, in housing and residence life. I'm kind of just giving some basic guidelines of what we want. Um, I want to start out by introducing myself and my colleagues. My name is Sean Sukies. I'm a resident director at Florida Gulf Coast University. Um, I'm in my first year there, um, and I have some other more seasoned colleagues here. We're going to introduce themselves. <laughs> yeah, much more seasoned. I turned 44 yesterday, so <laughs> thank you. Happy birthday to me. I'm Brian, Fisher. I'm Brian Fisher. I am the director for housing and residence life at Florida Gulf Coast University, and I've been there for 10 years next month, and uh, I've worked previously at Florida International University, the University of Alabama, and also at Florida State University. And I'm not as seasoned, but my name is Fletcher Ferguson. This is my third year at Florida Gulf Coast University. Uh, previously, I worked at the University of Memphis as well. I guess just mentioned that I worked at the University of South Carolina as a grad student before this. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, just kind of give you the basic topics to be covered. Is, uh, today, we're just going to talk a little about what is an emotional support animal as its definition by the ADA as well as the Fair Housing Act. Um, and then Brian Fisher is going to go into a little bit of review of law, talk to you about some best practices or what we've observed and what we have done in different situations. Um, to kind of give you an idea of what to do if you face any of these situations. Um, and then talk about our specific agreement. I have copies of it. We'll go over it a little bit, talking about what our meetings look like, how we kind of go about this process, and then do some case studies at the end. We do have a lot of information, so we're going to try and get through this as fast as we can. Um, we're going to ask you to hold questions till the end so we can get through everything. Um, if we need to hold off on the case studies, uh, we'll give those to you in an email format at the end. Um, but we're going to try and just go through this uh, as best we can to get you the information that you've come here again. So I'm going to get started off. I wanted to cover what what is an ESA in, in the first place. Um, you know, it's kind of come up most recently um, in, in the past few years. We've been getting more and more hearing about this. Um, and the first, the biggest part of it is that it's not a pet. Um, the, one of the biggest things that I hear from my colleagues as well as from everything that I've dealt with is you never refer to it as a pet. Um, it's not there to do something a pet would do. Um, it's not there to just be a companion. Um, it is there to provide emotional support for someone who has a, uh, a diagnosed disability or emotional stability issue that they need help with. Um, and so above all else, you should not refer to it as a pet. It is an emotional support animal. Um, and this is the definition of it. It provides emotional support that leads one or more identified symptoms um, of someone. It's usually diagnosed um, or given to someone as a prescription or kind of a, a remedy for something that is, you know, wrong with them by a doctor or a psychologist. So that's kind of how uh, that comes about in the first place. Um, we have heard a lot about service animals, um, you know, about the two questions you can ask service animals, and we'll talk about that for someone who has an animal on campus. We'll talk about that a little bit later, but I kind of wanted to go over some differences between emotional support animals and service animals. Um, so a service animal is, is usually a dog or a very small horse. Um, that's pretty much the only two things you're allowed to have. Um, it has to be specifically trained. It doesn't have to be professionally trained. You can train it yourself. Um, it has to be one of those two things. An emotional support animal does not have to be trained. Um, you can pretty much just go to the shelter if you've been approved and just adopt an animal, and that would be your emotional support animal. Family, pet, anything. No training is necessary. Um, there is no form of identification that is worn by either. Um, so you won't see, you don't, it doesn't necessarily have to have a, a service dog tag or a vest or anything like that. That's just kind of usually given um, to kind of signify that so you don't go and pet those animals when they're working. Um, so kind of takes away from their function within their role. Um, so it's, it's, it's not necessarily needed to be on there for both of them. Um, and so this is kind of just the basics of what are these, how do they start coming about. Um, Brian's now going to kind of go into the, uh, the review of law, talking about some of the relevant laws that have been passed, um, and some, some case law as well about what's happened in terms of the, how institutions have handled these ESAs in the past, um, and some outcomes that happened because of those things. So I'm going to give you a crash course on a lot of the different laws that have come about to get us in our current predicament for housing professionals uh, with service animals and emotional support animals. But before I do that, I want to get a sense of your familiarity uh, with the different laws. How many of you would say you have a fair amount of familiarity with the current law and the practices regarding service animals and emotional support animals? Let me see just a quick show of hands. You feel pretty comfortable with the law. How many of you would say you're so-so? Kind of, sort of, okay. And then how many, not so much? Okay, good. So we have, I would say, from the show of hands, about a third of each group, uh, there's some folks who feel more familiar with the law 
but then quite a few who don't. And, and a lot of that is because of the landscape with the law has changed. And all of those changes that we have seen have really happened in the last five years. So that's what I'm going to spend some time going through with you. We're going to spend time talking about these three main laws here. And they are the Americans with Disabilities Act, Section 504, and the Rehab Act of 1973, probably the one you're least familiar with. Uh, and and uh, I'll cover that one quickest because it's not as instrumental with our current predicaments, but it does tie things together to help explain with where we are right now. And then Fair Housing Act as well. Now, all of us have heard of and should be familiar with the Americans with Disability Act, which was a, a, a watershed moment of uh, federal law that passed in 1990. Now, what changed was in 2011, there was an update with the law that provided some new specific specifics in regards to service animals. So this was that time where some of the things started coming up and there were some changes that were occurring in the law that really have kind of begin to lead us into where we are right now. Uh, specifically under Title II and Title III, uh, with new regulations that patched in March 2011, uh, the ADA law got very, very specific in what they defined as a service animal. And so when we're talking about service animals, that's different than emotional support animals. So a service animal, as defined here by the law, is any dog that is individually trained to do work or perform a task for the benefit of an individual with a disability, including a physical, sen sensory, psychiatric, intellectual, or other mental disability. So a lot of times when we think of service animals, these are animals that are performing very specific tasks for somebody who has a disability. Obviously the one we're most familiar with is somebody who might be visually impaired, may have a dog that helps them to get around. Uh, one that's lesser familiar but quite common, uh, somebody might have epilepsy and a dog that can detect seizures. So quite often those would be the two that you see most often. Now there's other examples of the use of animals, but those are the two that we see uh, probably the most often. Now the Department of Justice also provided a provision that said uh, the, that emotional support animals were not covered here. Okay, so I want to clearly point that out. When you're looking at this law, it, it specifically said this sentence here, that emotional support animals are not covered here. And this was the beginning of this little bit of headbutting that we're going to start talking about with the law that you'll see in just a minute. So a lot of your campuses have an adaptive services office, an office that works specifically with students with disabilities. And they're usually the office that would work with these students who may need to bring in a service animal that could be in a classroom, could be in any different buildings, or it also could be in housing. These staff are trained or should be trained to only ask two questions. And these are the two questions that are specifically mentioned in the law that you're allowed to ask. And that is, is this service animal uh, required because of a disability and what work or tasks have the animal been trained to perform. Now the law actually says if it's obvious you shouldn't even ask these questions. So what I think what's that saying is the student has a visual impairment you shouldn't be bothering the student with asking these questions. But if it's not obvious then you are permitted to do so. Now a covered entity cannot require documentation such as proof that the animal has been certified trained or licensed as a service animal, and the previous questions are the only two inquiries that you're supposed to be making when you're asking about a service animal for a student with a disability. Uh, and so again here, D the DOJ's view, uh, DOJ's view is that when a service or task being performed is readily apparent, no inquiry should be permitted. There was a provision in the law added uh, that deals with miniature horses. This is a very rare circumstance, but the ADA law does specifically cover only dogs or miniature horses. No other animals are covered when we're talking about ADA law. And the scope goes beyond living accommodations, as I mentioned, classrooms, multi-purpose facilities. All areas of accommodation are included. You may not ask for the animal's training verification. An animal must be controllable and pose no threat to the others, to others within the community. So that's ADA law. Now the law that we're lesser, less familiar with is actually the first law. So this was the very first federal legislation that was passed in regards to uh, those who needed assistance with disabilities. And this is Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. It goes all the way back to 19, 
73. And, and I won't read through the law here, but what you should know is that any entity that receives some type of federal assistance uh, is expected to follow the law with Section 504. And the important thing to note here uh, is that Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, this federal law is what connects us to the Fair Housing Act which is what I'm about to talk about next, and where does fair housing uh, apply and how does fair housing work. So we've talked first about the Americans with Disabilities Act. Now Section 504 connects to fair housing, and as you see here, historically followed DOJ definition for service animal in the context of classroom and academic activities, but housing issues tie Section 502, 504 into the Fair Housing Act, which is FHA for short. So let me take a few minutes to talk about this microphone, <laughs> the Fair Housing Act. I think I might have fixed it just now. That's great. So the housing, uh, how many of you have heard of HUD before? Oh, I thought I fixed it. Okay. So HUD is a, a, a federal, uh, part of the federal government, and they uh, stand for Housing and Urban Development. They're basically responsible for forcing all laws in regards to the Fair Housing Act. Fair Housing Act is a broad sweeping piece of legislation that deals with discrimination with any public housing. And so their, their goal is to eliminate and, and alleviate discrimination in housing. And first obviously was passed dealing with a lot of tradition, traditional issues that we would see with discrimination in regards to race and ethnicity. Uh, and as uh, they've been in place for several decades now, they're, uh, they've expanded into different positions and most recently have started to get more involved in the area of service animals and with the emotional support animals. So let me go through a few things here. The Department of Justice position of limiting service animals to dogs, excluding emotional support animals, does not apply to FHA or Section 504 for housing. Rather, disabled individuals may request a reasonable accommodation for assistance animals in addition to dogs, including emotional support animals under FHA or Section 504, 504. And this last sentence is the most important sentence I'm going to read to you today, guys, and you need to remember this. When both laws apply, housing providers must meet the broader standard in deciding whether to grant reasonable accommodation requests. So fair housing opens the door for emotional support animals. And for those who are expected to follow both laws, ADA or fair housing, you have to apply the one that's broader. So for most of us in this room, when we're talking about providing public housing for our students, and you're trying to determine, well, do I use ADA or do I use fair housing in considering the request, you need to use both. And you need to apply which one it would ever be broader within the request. So if you're working specifically with a student with a disability who has a service animal, you can use the ADA law. But if you're considering other any other request, you really should be using fair housing. And if you're not, the Department of Justice and our Office of Civil Rights would love to talk to you. <laughs> and we'll get to that. So HUD defines assistance animal as any animal that provides assistance or performs tasks for the benefit of a person with a disability or provides emotional support that alleviates one or more identified symptoms of a, of a person's disability. It can be any breed. It can be any type. An animal does not have to be trained or certified. HUD emphasizes that it's a violation of FHA uh, to restrict this type of assistance animal and that you cannot apply the ADA service animal de definition. So the housing provider may deny requests only if the granting request will impose an undue financial and administrative burden. So some of you approach this and look at this topic as, well, what are my opportunities to create some restrictions here? And so you could read this sentence and say, well, you know, if I put the animal in there, they may have some things, it's gonna cost us some money, so I can say no. I'll come back to this piece of this. You should not, over, you should not try to overapply the law and the exceptions to the law, uh, because that's really gonna set yourself up to be creating conflict with the students that are gonna be making these requests. What would I consider an undue financial uh, example for bringing in an animal? An elephant. Okay, there's a good example. Somebody wants to bring in an animal that you flat out can't really accommodate in the type of housing you're offering, well, there might be an example. Now, I picked an extreme one, so maybe a smaller horse, you know, something where the, it just poses some type of undue financial burden. 
allowing the animal funding fundamental all fundamentally alter the housing provider services you know we might be able to brainstorm examples of that and then allowing the specific animal in question to pose a direct health and safety uh, you know if the animal could be a threat might not be safe for other students some animals we can think of that might fit in that uh, category so here come the ESAs so I'm just going to go through a few things here quickly the broader category under FHA is really what you need to be applying uh, with the, with, when you're considering requests and it cannot be limited to service animals you need to include emotional support animals and therapy animals so under HUD any person who has a disability the animal is necessary to afford a person with a disability an equal opportunity to use and enjoy uh, the dwelling and if there's a relationship between the disability and the assistance the animal provides does the person seeing to use and live with the animal have a disability and does the person make the request of the disability need for their assistance animal to either perform a task and this is the key difference between what we were talking about before with the service animal it either only has to perform a task or provide emotional support now when we're dealing with emotional support animal requests you can require documentation and this is where you can set up some things to create reasonable provisions on your campus but if your students are seeing a, a mental health professional uh, a doctor and the doctor provides documentation that this student needs has a disability and would benefit emotionally from having this animal then in accordance with the law they've met the provisions that are required so and that's kind of what this goes into here the disability is readily apparent or known but the disability um, uh, disability disability related need for the assistant animal uh, then the student should be granted the request and documentation from a physician a social worker or a mental health professional uh, and again if the documentation provided states that the person has a disability and would benefit from the, the support of the animal either through task or emotional support then you need to consider that request so let me stop there. Are there any questions about what I just said? Yes. Are we still holding questions for the end or can I ask a question? Yeah, just quickly in terms of what we covered with the law. Okay. Um, so I might want to wait. Okay, okay. Any questions with what we covered the law in terms of distinctive between ADA and the fair housing and how we're applying service animals and emotional support animals? I just want to make sure folks understand that part or portion of it. Okay, why, why don't we cover the lawsuits that we've seen? And I think, how many of you have seen some of the lawsuits so far? Okay, so let me talk about a few of them. The one that kind of happened before a lot of this stormed up was uh, the United States versus Millican, which was in 2009. Now this was a student who was requesting a service animal and the campus actually denied uh, the use of this service animal. Uh, and, and, and one thing to point out too, in all of these cases, the campus is lost. They lost all of these lawsuits or they settled uh, and so judgment was for the plaintiff they did receive a settlement there was a student who had absolute epilepsy that was denied a service animal and then in march 2013 uh, a case that's a little lesser known grand valley state the student had a guinea pig they settled out of court they denied that guinea pig this the university settled for forty thousand dollars i'll point out in the last two cases uh, the settlement in the University of Nebraska Kearney, I believe, was $100,000. And this most recent case from just a few weeks ago with Kent State was $145,000. So you remember when I said an, an undue financial burden? So that's the balance I would use. Is this going to cost you more or less than $145,000 to accommodate the animal? And if your answer is it will cost us less to accommodate that elephant, then let them have the elephant. Now, again, I'm, play, I'm being playful here, but what you need to see is this pattern. Fair housing with the support of the Department of Justice and with the Office of Civil Rights. Offices, most of your general counsels are not interested in challenging. Now, a few of your campuses, maybe they are. On my campus, they are not. Uh, so you need to gauge those types of things on your campus. Where does your general counsel stand on these topics? But right now, when they're finding campuses who are not taking service animal requests or and this i did not say and i want to make sure you understand the differences between and and or when you're talking about law whether you, if you're not interested in taking requests from service animals or emotional support animals they are interested in visiting you on your campus and talking to you about what your policies are 
what your practices are, and how you're reviewing these requests. Now, the one last thing I want to point out about the Nebraska Kearney case, because this is one of the things for a lot of us who've been in this profession for a long time, well, on a college campus, fair housing doesn't apply. And that's what the Nebraska Kearney case really turned around. The judge specifically ruled there that, yes, absolutely, college campus student housing is a part of the Fair Housing Act. Even though, yes, your housing is transient, it is temporary, it is an educational setting, and the students don't come and stay there forever, doesn't matter. It's a part of fair housing. You can't discriminate on your campus, and you can't uh, discriminate against students who are requesting emotional support animals. And, it, and that was defined very clearly. So I'm going to let my colleagues continue on here and talk about some best practices that have begun to really develop over the last, really the last couple of years as, as these cases have become defined. Well, when we talk about best practices, one thing that we always want to remember is we do not want to be discriminatory. That is the number one thing you want to make sure that you handle. You know, so a couple of things is you want to try to avoid being sued. We just gave the amounts. You know, I'm just saying I don't think none of us want to pay those amounts or deal with the person who will pay the amounts and call them to their offices. So I think keeping that in mind is always very important. So one question is, how does your institution explain to students what emotional, uh, the emotional support animal policy is? Not only the student that's asking for it, but also this is going to affect other students maybe when they see it in the hall, you know, if they're living with that student as well who will have the animal. How does your school go about explaining that? You know, how do you market this? Do you remain silent and let the students find out themselves? You know, do you say, okay, well, when somebody finds out, we'll make sure you get what you need. We'll get you to the correct offices, get all the paperwork done. Or go about it like that, or do you put it out there for all students to know and say, if you want to have an emotional support animal, this is how to go about it. Also, how do you handle roommates that may be allergic? When you look at animals specifically, uh, cats, long-haired dogs, plenty of people become allergic to that, to those animals, or are allergic, allergic to those animals. So how do you want to go about handling roommates if they are allergic? Because it will become a problem, because they will read in their contracts, like most of them, no pets are allowed, and that's how they will view the animal. So how do you go about explaining that to them that this animal will be in their space? You know, uh, also, what if a staff member needs an emotional support animal? Let's say an RA you know, needs one, um, professional staff member needs one, how do you go about handling that? What does the law say about that? And what if the ESA brings pets into the space? Are we responsible for handling that? In the contract, are they responsible for handling? Any pets that may come in, please, ticks, anything of that nature. When you're asking yourself these questions, if you don't know the answer to that right now, you need to sit down with a couple of your colleagues. The housing needs to sit down. The general counsel's office needs to sit down. Adaptive services, see how y'all are going about handling these types of things. Seeing what that conversation looks like with the students. Seeing what process that you all want to begin following as you go through this process with the student. How many of you have had an RA or resident director already ask for emotional support? Show of hands. So this was an issue that just showed itself on our campus a few weeks ago. So just showed itself on our campus a few weeks ago. So another example of, of something you have may not have thought about yet, but want to. So here are a couple ways that we learned to deal with the previous scenarios. So. If you have a policy, that policy uh, needs to clearly state the practices and you need to follow it to a T. Know everything that's in your policy. Know those laws, know what you have laid out, and follow those. Do not try to deviate from those, you know, based on certain situations unless you talk to those who are important in handling those situations, general counsel. Um, don't ask too many questions, as we said earlier. Those two questions that we gave you are the two questions that should be listed. Um, don't ask for too much documentation, as Brian said. Um, like I said, you can ask for a note from the position, uh, the contract, you know, things of that nature. But you want to make sure that you don't ask for too much. Because if you start asking for too much, then you can run into some issues. Are you asking too much? Are you getting into too much of the, uh, the situation that's going on with the students? Um, don't steer the student towards a specific type of housing. I think that's a lot of people, and even we've had that conversation, you know, uh, before really diving into the law, I asked myself, you know, where can we look into different types of housing? But no, that's discriminatory. You're trying to push them towards a specific type of housing when 
all housing is available to them under this. So if it's apartment style, suite style, if they live in doubles, you really need to be able to make sure they can stay in any type of housing because they're already in that space. So what does it look like if you start trying to move them to different spaces and get them out of the specific space of that nature? Um, do not require a bed deposit. And I ask them to put down extra money for this uh, because it's not a pet, first off. Um, and then by law, they are allowed to have this animal in the space. So asking for a deposit on something that is being allowed already is really not uh, ethical when you deal with these type of situations. And when you think about it, would you want anybody to ask you in any type of other situation that you may have, you know, that you may be dealing with a person that they want to? You want to ask those type of questions and you have to understand that the department of justice and office of civil rights are already and willing to come and speak to you like brian said if something of that nature comes up they're ready to come see you and fully prepared to bring lawsuits against the university for the student they are there for the students they've seen these lawsuits so they're prepared at all times for this dealing with roommates um so I was the person on our campus who had the first emotional support animal in the area. Um, but I never had any issues with the first animal. Very happy, but that doesn't always happen. So one thing we did as part of our uh, process is making sure we meet with all the residents uh, who will be living with the student with the emotional support animal as well. Um, we explained to them that the animal will be in the apartment. We explained to them where the animal can be. The animal can be where that student is in the apartment. So their bedroom, living room, kitchen, all those spaces are available to them. Explain to them again that it's not a pet because our contract states that no pets are allowed other than fish and 20 gallon tanks. So that's always one of the questions that come up. Students always come to me and say, well, Fletcher, I said that I'll, I signed the contract stating that I want to live in an apartment and no pets were allowed. So starting to have that conversation with them that it's not a pet. If this person has an emotional support animal and it's allowed in that space. And then I also explain expectations of our contract that we have, that Sean will be passing out as well, to the uh, students. So we talk about care and treatment of the animal, who's responsible for that, it's the responsibility of the person who uh, is, has the animal, handling the assistance animal, uh, things such as when maintenance comes in, having the animal um, you know, stored away in the room, indicate that you want maintenance to come in, it's not our responsibility to evacuate the animal in case of emergencies and things of that nature. We want to make sure that everyone in the apartment understands this and knowing it's not their responsibility to take care of the animal, it's the responsibility of the person with the emotional support animal to handle this. But it's also good to go over because you do have things, you may have um, maintenance issues and facilities issues caused by the animal, you know, damage to furniture and things of that nature and common spaces. So people want to begin to ask, you know, well, you know, let's say, um, a cat, you know, scratched up the end of a, a couch, but it's the responsibility of the person with the animal to take care of that. So what if a roommate is allergic? And we ran into this a couple of times. So the language in the Fair Housing Act uh, leaves some room for judgment in this, and people, uh, as we, you know, ask around and start working with other colleagues, have different ways of handling it. For us, by law, thing, well, by law, the animal is allowed in that space. So the animal is allowed in that bedroom and any other space that the student is uh, allowed to be in, such as the, live, uh, the common spaces, the kitchens, things of that nature. What I usually tell students is the animal can go wherever that person with the emotional support animal wants to go. They don't have to be in your specific bedroom. That's what I usually tell them. So if a student believes that they cannot stay with that animal because they are allergic, or for other reasons, some students just decide that they don't want to stay with them. We get into the meeting sometimes and the student will say, I legitimately just don't want to live with a cat, a dog, a bunny, hedgehog, and things of that nature. What we do as an institution is we look for a space to accommodate the student who doesn't want to live with that animal. We look to move them because, like you said, by law, that animal is allowed in the space. So if you decide you don't want to live in that space, that's on you for us. We look to move you to a different space, you know, accommodate you with the same type of space, if different space is available, and you want to look in there, we can look into that as well. But once again, we try not to be discriminatory. Now, some people will say, well, what about the people with allergies? 
it's nothing to say anything about that right now. And something about that may come out as the law is kind of broad right now, as it kind of begins to become more specific over time, we may have something that covers that. But right now, we look to move personally with values. Now, we have had some people with the emotional support animals say, you know, I don't want to cause any issues for my roommates. I look to move. But at the same time, that can also cause other issues because now you have to put forth space that there's no one who's allergic to the animal. And then that can become very hectic over time because if they try not to bring the animal to the space until they move into a space where they feel comfortable, they can go long periods of time without the animal. But after they've had the meeting with us, that animal's allowed in the space. So our thing is we want to make sure that that animal gets to the student as soon as possible so they can have the support they need from that animal. And I'll turn it over to my colleague, Sean. So one of the reasons we wanted to talk to y'all about this is that as we've had a extreme increase in the number of emotional support animals on our campus. Um, only two years ago, we had four. And as of last week, we have 24 on our campus now. Um, and so we have added 20 animals in two years um, to our campus. Um, and so we kind of saw this as something that, well, maybe we're just not the only ones who are facing this. Let's talk about it with other people and see what other people are doing and give our information out how we've been dealing with this. Um, and that we can see it's, they're just gonna keep coming. We can't stop them from coming and we shouldn't. So let's talk about and inform other people about what we're doing. Um, and so, yeah, I expect this to hit 30 by the summer, um, by the number of people that are coming to us for this. Um, I kind of wanted to talk to you first of all, we, Fletcher mentioned a little bit earlier about uh, what do you do about a resident assistant who wants an ESA? So we ran into this issue um, where we, we kind of were dwindling down to our alternate pool. Um, one of the alternate candidates had a, a need for an emotional support animal and they were already living in housing with it. So what, what do we do with that? Um, in our specific instance, we initially talked to our general counsel and saw what they advised us to do. Um, and they advised us that you should treat them as any other student. You should not put into a factor that they have an emotional support animal, not, not weigh at all on your determination of their ability to be an RA. Um, and so they were one of the top candidates and we did bring them into the space um, and hired them as an, as an RA with their emotional support animal. They were featured in an article in our student newspaper um, about a week ago um, that, went, that went out um, about their emotional support animal and talking to students. Um, and so it's, it's something that you really have to talk about with your general counsel on your own in your own um, campus if you, this is something that might happen to you or that you were running into um, to figure out. Our general counsel advised us to do it um, but yours may, like Brian said, they want to challenge something and go ahead in a different, a different direction. Um, so just kind of want to let you know that, that happened to us. Um, I want to go over our ESA process. What happens when someone wants an emotional support animal on FTCU's campus? I have a few handouts that Brian's going to uh, give to you, Brian and Fletcher. Um, I don't have enough for everyone here. We weren't expecting this amount of people. Um, so if you just want one, please raise your hand and, and Brian will I'll bring it around to your Fletcher. Um, so this is our process that we have laid out. Um, this is only the part that I give to residents when I meet with them. Um, there is a much longer version that I have one copy of up here if you'd like to see the full thing. Um, but this is just the part that the resident gets. Um, so this is about a third of what is our total policy. Um, so if you want to see the full thing, you can come up at the end and you can definitely do it. Um, so the first thing that happens on our campuses are they meet with our disability office, our adaptive services office. So they will sit down with our director of adaptive services. And they will have a conversation. Uh, they have to provide a letter from their um, doctor, their physician, if that's a psychiatrist or whatever it might be, um, saying that they have a documented need for this disability, um, they have a need for this animal. Um, and that is what the, the doctor is prescribing to them as their remedy for that emotional need, um, whatever it might be. So they sit down with that and our adaptive services people say, yeah, this is a definite need that you need this, I understand that, we have this documentation from you, um, we're gonna go ahead and give this to housing. Um, I meet with the students right now. Um, our person who usually does it is out on paternity leave. Um, so I'm meeting with them right now. And so what I will do is I get an email from adaptive services saying, just wanted to let you know, you know, so-and-so has been approved for emotional support animal. Um, go ahead and do your part of the process. So what happens is um, I send an email out to that student. Um, and I say, hey, there's the times out available. Please come down and sit, sit down with me and talk about this. Um, so then what we do is we come down and sit down in my office. Um, and we go over the document that you have in your hands if you were lucky enough to get one. Um, so we, I literally will read this line by line um, and explain to them this is exactly what you need to do, um, what we are expecting of you. Um, and any breach of this contract may allow us to revisit 
um, your ability to hold this emotional support animal in your space. Um, one of the biggest things is keeping the animal under control um, in terms of barking and causing an unnecessary um, disturbance to other members of the community. Um, that's something we've had to revisit before. As well as waste. Um, in our policy, it says that we have to have a specific area designated um, for an animal to you know, use the bathroom at. Um, if it's a dog, usually, um, that you run into that issue. And we do not have that on our campus. We just kind of say you can just do it anywhere as long as you're cleaning up after yourself. Um, that'd be something you want to be reason as well. Is there a specific place outside of a residence hall um, that you want to have the animal be able to go? Um, if you're in a city, where can the animal go? If you don't have grass or somewhere for that to happen, um, how are you going to handle that side of things? And our campus, we're very fortunate to have lots of grass and lots of areas for animals to go to the bathroom at. Um, and so they can just kind of do that anywhere. As long as they're cleaning up after their cell, that's not an issue. Um, some of the other big things that we are from Florida um, on the coast, and so we have something called hurricanes. Um, and so I go over with the student, um, what's going to happen if a hurricane comes? What are you going to do with your animal? It's not allowed in our Red Cross shelter. Um, you're not allowed to bring that animal in here. So what are you going to do with your animal if a hurricane comes? Um, we had, and students don't really ever think about that. So that's something I really try and press home with them. Um, you're not bringing it to the shelter. You have to find either a vet who's going to take care of it or take it home. Um, because students tend to not think of these, these you know, out there scenarios of a hurricane happening. Um, so those are some of the bigger things I usually talk about where they, they don't really understand it. Um, but it just hasn't really crossed their mind yet to, to, to think about these things. Um, and some of the other big ones is um, taking care of the animal. Um, and that they're not abusing the animal. We want to make sure that the animal is also um, in a living environment that's suitable for it. Um, we want to make sure they're taking care of it, and also that it's them taking care of it. One of the issues we ran into is that um, one of our residents kind of just let her roommates take care of it as well. Um, and it's not their emotional support animal, it's the students, and so it's not their responsibility. Um, she got mad saying that her residents weren't helping or her, her roommates weren't helping pay for food, so um, it's, it's her responsibility, so she has to do that. Um, so things like that to consider in these things that we talk about with our residents saying you need to be the one to do this, you are the one who is taking care of this animal. It can accompany you into different spaces, um, but it cannot go into other people's spaces. So we have a lot of apartments in our in our university, and so it can go into the common area, the kitchen, the bedroom, but it cannot go into your roommate's bedroom. So we're doing health and safety inspections, we find someone's emotional support animal in the wrong room, they have to go through our conduct process or you know, is it do you send them through the conduct process or do you talk to them um, in a different setting? What does that look like at your institution? How do you handle emotional support animals on the conduct side of things? We had a case study talking about that. It's not looking like we're gonna get to that. We wanna make sure we take time for your questions. So, you know, one of the situations we ran into is that we had an emotional support animal who, um, well, it wasn't an emotional support animal yet. We found an animal in the space and through our conduct process, they were sent through. And the day before they were gonna have their meeting, they got it approved to be an emotional support animal but they were still in our conduct process, had a meeting scheduled. So what do you do at that point? Um, I believe we ended up finding them not responsible for that, for that incident, what's your right? Yeah, so they were found not responsible because they had gotten the correct documentation, but they didn't have it at the time. So is that something, are you gonna hold them accountable for that when it wasn't, or are you not? In our case, we didn't because we wanted to blame the safe side and we figured that one little thing was okay, better than the $145,000 that Fisher mentioned earlier. Um, and so, but that's something you need to think about with. But conduct side of things. So after they sit down with meet with me, uh, when I go over everything and we sign the end of it, um, there's two signs they sign: one agreeing to the contract, and the second one letting us um, essentially use the information as best of our ability, saying that you are giving us permission to release this information to people who need to know, um, i.e., your roommates, because we need to talk to them about this, and any other housing staff um, who may need to you know, talk to someone about this or know about this. So that's what that second signature line on that set, on that last page is for. Um, something else we run into um, is maintenance staff. If the animal is in that space, if we do not allow our maintenance staff to go in and do maintenance um, in that area, if it's, it might be detrimental to the pet. So if they're doing something and patching a wall, um, and if, or excuse me, an emotional support animal, um, if it might be detrimental to that animal, um, what does that look like for your maintenance staff if they come in and fix something? Something else to consider. Um, so after all that happens, they sit down and we get all four roommates. Um, in our case, are three. We have three or four um, in our areas. So we'll sit down with the resident director of that building or that community that they're in. And all four, all four, four or five of them will meet and we'll go over this again with all of them. Reiterating everything to the roommates so that they're on board as well. So if they understand what their um, their roommate's expectation is for their ESA, as well as what their role in that process is like, that they don't have to pay for the food. They don't have to take care of the animal. It's not their animal. 
Um, and so really explain that to the roommates as well so that they're on board and can be supportive of the process. Most of the times when we meet with the residents, they've already had a large conversation with their, um, their roommates about it. The roommates are already on board. They're supportive of it. Um, but there are some times when they're very against it. And so how are you going to handle those meetings? Like Fletcher mentioned some of the best practices earlier, but we've done in the past. But again, things to consider when you're moving forward. Um, in terms of how are you going to handle some of these difficult issues that just come around this and that, you know, we're trying to do the best for our students, but what is best for all parties involved? So um, we did have some case studies um, to go over with you. I mentioned one of them, um, but we definitely want to take time for your questions. Um, it seemed like there were going to be quite a few of them. So we wanted to open up the floor at this point. Um, if you just want to raise your hands and we'll, we'll do our best to answer your questions as we can. Um, yeah. So you just go first. Yeah, two questions. One, I'm not interested in being sued, um, but by anybody. So are there any current cases or anybody, other residents um, where they have sued for allergies or yeah. um, excessive barking or disruption? Yeah. Or are there any cases in the works? So the question was, I don't know if the live stream needs to be repeated, but um, is there any things in the works right now of a resident suing another resident um, or suing the university for um, a detriment to their own living space, whether because the animal is barking too much or they had allergies or things like that. To my knowledge, there is not um, any of those in the pipeline right now. And Brian's shaking his head, so I think he agrees. So we have not seen anything such okay. as that. My second question is it truly worthless of the type of animal um, someone can have, or the state, local um, laws apply? Yeah. As far it's, the question was, is, is there a truly limitless amount to what can be heard? The, the, what the, the law states is that it cannot fundamentally alter your ability to do your job. So like Brian said, if it's, a, if it's an elephant, you can't. But you also might want to look at, is a great thing too big? And that's something that you need to visit your individual campus and what your general counsel thinks. Um, it's not something we have run into yet, but most of our animals have been smaller. And it's something we've had conversations about um, in that, you know, can we ask for, you know, that student to have a different prescription um, in terms of what they can, you know, have to help them with their with their needs. Um, does it have to specifically be a Great Dane? Does that specifically be, you know, a giant dog or can a smaller dog be that? Do the same thing. Let me mention one other thing too with the law. I have in my hand uh, after the Nebraska Kearney case uh, was uh, finalized, HUD released this memo that's in my hand. <laughs> dated April 25th, 2013. You can get this memo online, and I would use this as the reference point because this is the most current announcement from HUD, and it's only about you know six or seven pages. Um, and it, it, let me see here, actually it's, it's seven pages, so it, it, in the last page is just a signature. So it only takes you a few minutes to read. But it spells out a lot of the things. So this is our best guidance right now in terms of what we should try to do. It's not going to answer every question. So I think some of the questions that you have, and probably a lot of other folks are, well, what about this or what about that? And so the law doesn't answer those questions for us right now. So what we need to do as press professionals is uh, use our best judgment and try to make sure that if you were in a courtroom and you had to answer questions about the decisions that you made, could you do it in a way to where you were explaining to that judge who doesn't care what your profession is that you didn't do anything discriminatory against a student who needed a request to for housing in regards to emotional support animals? As long as you feel like you meet that benchmark or that criteria, then I think you're fine. But just keep in mind that could be where you end up in trying to explain this. Whether that's, you know, you actually get to that point, but perhaps you may end up in your general counsel's office or your boss's office or your boss's boss's office. You know, Office of Civil Rights came to our office, uh, to our campus, and visited our adaptive services office because they did, were asking more questions than just the two that I showed to you. So that you know, they had students who had disabilities and they needed a service animal. So they were asking them a few questions. Well, talk to me more about what you need the service animal for and how are you going to use it on campus? And Office of Civil Rights came down with thunder on our campus and said. You've got two you can ask. Stop asking anymore. And so I, you know, when I, I wasn't really kidding when I told you that. When they come to your campus, they're they're very strict. They're not interested in in the fact that you're a nice person. And that you they, they, they you come off as somebody who's caring with students and oh by the way, that's what my college degrees are in. And you know, I really do want to help all the students. They're, they're not interested in that. 
And so they want to hear from you specifically about what you're doing to apply the law. Uh, and if you're not applying it the way they interpret it, then you're going to have a problem. And so that's what you, you should really uh, take a look at. And so, you know, get this document. And, you know, I, I was reading it earlier, and I want to share another piece of it. DOJ's revised ADA regulations define service animal narrowly. So in FHA, remember I was comparing the two laws in ADA, they use the word in here, narrow. But that law is too narrow. Service animals isn't broad enough. Emotional support animals need to be included. And so that's what this says. And there are no restrictions in this document about the type of animal. So, so let's start picking animals out of the wild kingdom. You know, there was a turkey on a plane a few weeks ago, guys, that took a seat, took a seat on a plane free of charge because it was an emotional support animal. And the airline didn't stop it. Who does that make a lot of sense to in this room? And the answer I will give you guys is the law doesn't always make sense. Okay? Uh, that's why I didn't become an attorney. That's why I'm in housing. All right? I, I was political science undergrad. I was going to law school. And somewhere between here and there, I figured out the law doesn't always make sense. You have to wear a seatbelt, but if you ride a motorcycle, you don't have to wear a helmet in Florida. Law doesn't make sense all the time, guys. Turkeys in residence halls is okay under fair housing right now. I don't agree with it. But that's where we're at. So hopefully that gives you some more depth and perspective in terms of trying to apply a law that may not always feel right. But again, we can't be perceived as discriminating against somebody who may have a legitimate mental health issue. Okay. Hopefully that helps in trying to evaluate law a little better. A lot of questions still, so let's keep moving. Yep. For the questions that we get from neighbors, non-roommates, or personnel that don't aren't privy to that information. We inform our maintenance staff because we want them to not walk into a room that has an animal and be surprised and to be able to distinguish is this a room that has an approved animal versus an animal that may not be there uh, as permitted by our policies. And so we do inform them. You know, if you're getting questions from students, my advice would be that you could tell them that you know if you're seeing an animal on campus, please report it to us and we'll determine if it's an approved animal or not because you may be the animal they are seeing as a pet. And so, you know, and I would tell them that if you're continuing to see the animal and you've made us aware, that means that animal's been approved. That'd uh, probably be my best advice for you there. Yeah, I think Brian might have signed in that document. I think I don't think that that is protected information. I don't think that we consider that. So we would just say that they have an emotional support animal. Yeah, I think that's fine to answer that yeah. in a restrictive audience. Yeah. You know, I don't think you need to send them a mass email no, to no, all no. of your residents and say, here are the list of the five residents on campus that have an approved animal. But if someone asked, that's what we Yeah, I, I don't think that you're violating law to do that. Right. Now, you could call them to someone's office and they said, do let us know. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Well, um, I, I actually, this campus I work at, having a emotional support animal is confidential. We can't share that because okay. our counseling center, like we all sit down and they're like, no, it's, you can't share that. It's their personal information. Just like their grades and their records, you can't share that. You can't share that they have I mean, you see the complexities of some of the things you're running into. So, you know, I would, again, I kind of go back to what I said. I, I would tell a student, if you've informed us that there's an animal there and we've not taken action, then I'll let you defer that that animal's been approved. You know, you could word it a little bit differently than I did. But so, yeah, I could see because, you, you know, disability information is protected too. So it's a very complex topic. Now, especially when you're dealing with housing like ours, multi-dwelling settings, students living literally next to each other. So, yes? Uh, the emotional support animals have to be in the same level of control that you were talking about with the uh, uh, disability uh, education and animals. And if you had a student complaining of uh, like being negatively emotionally affected by the level of To my knowledge, we have not had that happen. Um, we've been lucky in that the roommates have been supportive of the animal coming into the space so far. Um, and if they haven't, they've been moved. Um, just because we feel that it's discriminatory to move 
it, it is to move the student utilizing most of the support animal. And so we have not run into that yet. Um, I think that'd be the, another good conversation to have with your colleagues about what would happen in that instance. Um, okay. Amber? Um, I have two questions. One, I'm sure we talk a lot about apartments and how we yes. give them a lot of possible institutions like the living room and yes. things like that. How does that look differently for a traditional software thing? The type of bathroom? Is it has a community like living room yeah. amongst the whole floor? Is it yeah. the end there? So the, the, the question is, in a more traditional style hall where you have like a, a circle of rooms in the bathroom in the middle or a community area, what can you do with it? My understanding of it is that anywhere that the person can go, the animal can go. Um, so if it is a community space where the person can go, the animal can go there. Um, and we cannot restrict them from going to public places like that or, or places they are allowed to be. Um, so my question is, in terms of being able to have like full control over yes. the animal, um, I, I've ran into an issue before where there was a pet snake that was a um, animal. I feel like the person holding it walking around the hall. So if you run into that, we can walk around the store. Yeah. Somebody has a pet snake, somebody has a pet bunny, the floor, obviously that's not ideal. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Is that what I heard? Okay. Uh, usually what we, what, I, what we usually tell them is that it needs to be in their living space. Emotional support animal when it comes to us is really different with housing, so it needs to be in that living space. It does look different depending on apartments and you know, uh, suite style or you know, community style. One thing I, I do have to say is that sometimes when I'm dealing with residents, uh, the student with the emotional support animal will also agree to other rules, but we can't say that they have to follow it. So they might look at their roommates and say, Well, I don't want the animal in the kitchen. They were like, Well, I don't want the animal in the kitchen either. So they won't have the animal. So they do come up with, it, with that agreement themselves sometimes. The question is if that changes, you know, how do you go about handling it? Is it a roommate agreement that you have, or what does the law say at the same time? We're going to follow the law. And just to add to that, just because you approve the animal, doesn't mean you can't have expectations for the students with those animals. That's not what we've said today. If we're telling you, you you have to approve the animals, but then if the students can't follow reasonable expectations, now, reasonable is a subjective word, uh, and you don't want to over-apply that. But as long as they're uh, making sure that they're taking appropriate care of the animal and not disrupting the community, then I think it's okay. But if there's, they bring pests into the hall, you can hold them accountable for that. You shouldn't charge a deposit on the front end, because if the student can't afford that, they could use that as a reason to say you're discriminatory. Please note that the law specifically says that. Don't charge a deposit. The law says that. But they bring fleas in and it costs you $500 to eradicate the fleas. You can hold the student fully responsible for that $500 charge. And I think it would be appropriate to say, don't have fleas again, or we will consider removing the animal. I think that that would all be appropriate. And I think again, depending on the judge that you could end up in front of, you could explain that with a straight face. I could, um, I might get in trouble, but <laughs> you know, again, you have to kind of weigh this 145,000 fleas, you know? so. I mean, just sometimes consider some of those choices. I think also, Amory, for that one specifically, the document that we passed out, I think that's something that could be included in there if the general counsel allowed that, um, to write that in there, say reasonable expectations as set between that meeting, um, to, to kind of cover those those boundaries of the snake and a bunny on the same floor and things like that, and people not being comfortable with it. Um, and the, the reasonable expectations that Brian mentioned as well. Um, you know, if someone is very uncomfortable by a snake, I, I hate snakes, so I don't necessarily would. I wouldn't necessarily be comfortable with that being around me. So I think also just communicating to the student that we, you know, you need to be careful around other students because the snake is just how it's perceiving them and things like that. So let's you know, we can't go back and I'll come forward. So let's go all the way back. You speak up. Yeah. Okay. Great. Tell them that Dr. Fisher said you should have a policy. <laughs> and they're welcome to email us and we can help them with that. Yeah. But the policies aren't written by housing staff. Right. 
policy should be contributed to by housing staff, but it should include in the input of any office on your campus that oversees disability services and a general counsel's office. And if your attorney's on your campus, you maybe don't have an office like that, then consult someone. Every campus is a little bit different in the culture. And that's where you're the expert and familiar with what would work best with your campus. So you should take a collaborative approach to try to develop that to, to serve as a guide. Because that'll be one of the first criticisms OCR and DOJ would have is, where's your policy? And if you don't have one, well, then you know, they're going to they're gonna let you know about that. I think if you're also at a level where, I know like for me, if I was like, hey, we don't have a notice of support animal policy. I've been here for six months. I don't really know what to do. Um, I think it's also just having a conversation of, hey, I went to this presentation to CEO and they said we can get sued and lose $145,000 if we don't do this. We probably want to do this. Um, I think that's the, that's the starting block to even have that conversation if that hasn't been had yet. Um, and, you know, having coming with armed with that knowledge to say we need our general counsel, we need to hire a consultant or someone to help us with this we can't just necessarily dictate the policy ourselves. I think it's where that starting point should happen. Um, and like I said, we're always available for um, help if you need it. Go on to the next question. Yep. Could you mention So what are we doing? So in, term, in terms of marketing, are we saying, hey, yeah, everyone, come have an ECA. That's how you do it. Uh, we've, we have chosen to remain silent um, in that we let the, the students kind of figure it out for themselves. Um, so they can go to adaptive services, or we have a counseling center on campus. So if they're talking to the counselors and the counselors started to see, that might be, <clears throat> oh, just my voice is going, um, a direction that they might want to go in. They can kind of guide them, that student, in that direction. Um, but we have not chosen to, to go out there. Our numbers are that this high already. Um, and so we don't know what would happen if we started saying, hey, this is how you do it. Um, I think there is some, some debate to be had between the two points of, are you serving your students well? by not doing that, but also you hindering yourself by doing it. Um, so I think that's a conversation to have on your own campus, but that is what we have chosen to do at this point. Yeah. You re may remember the point that Sean made during the presentation about the student who went through the conduct process, who had a pet, and then not during the conduct process, the goal is that it was an emotional support animal. And then we basically chose not to continue the conduct process at that point and ask the student to provide documentation. I asked our general counsel's office is it appropriate for us to continue that conduct case? And they advised us not to. And he said, his advice to me, our, one of our attorneys was, if you want to market your practices with your how you take emotional support animals to all of your students and make them fully aware so that they can come in in advance and properly document all the animals that they want for emotional support, then on the backside, when you're finding out students who have pets slash ESAs that are not approved, then you could take them through the conduct process because you've done a, the appropriate job to educate them on the front end. So I, my, my decision at that point was drop the conduct case, let them go through the ESA process. Because I, this is a philosophical choice you need to make on your campus. Given our, our students, I think we would have a lot more than 20 some animals uh, if we took the time to educate them about this. So, and, and I'm one of those staff members, and you can criticize me, it's fine, who's not fully comfortable with that. Uh, and so I, we're continuing with our strategy now, and uh, I, we do expect this slope to continue to go up, but that's the way we, we are choosing to do it on our campus. Well, what, what impact has that article about the student RA you hired had on your your want, desire for emotional support? It was only two weeks ago, Okay. so I can't answer that. <laughs> but the, the thing I've told the staff is nobody reads the student newspaper. So. <laughs> That's my chance to take a shot at them without it getting in trouble here. So we only have time for about two more questions. We will stay back at the end um, to answer any that you want. But I know that your hand has been up for a while, so I'll definitely go over here. Has anyone removed an emotional support animal from campus? So the question is: Is anyone removed an emotional support animal from campus? For the, kind of for the room. Your hand shot up. We removed them because it was with an RA, and the RA kept breaking the policy with regard to emotional support animals. We gave her the choice to either get rid of the animal or um, not work as an RA anymore, and she chose not to work as an RA. Anyone else? All the way to the back. Yeah, we removed one. Uh, we also had surgery on the MSU center, and the uh, social service was tied in multiple surgery on the MSU center. That's awesome. All right, one more question. Yes. I was going to say a couple of weeks ago, they started saying that about the spring of the plane, they 
connections to big online. One of the things they address is how easy it is for people to get off stop location. Yeah. Not really seeing clinicians paying their pains, $150 on the internet. And we actually had this happen on our campus. We had a student who had a cat check my name with a virtual support animal. She had done none of the registration, had to take the facility offices. When they got a hold of her documentation, it was showing that she had been and seeing a clinician in California or from Virginia. So she had questions about your, your documentation. The clinician said she had a need for an and say she had a medical yeah. need or a medical support need. And she got online and found out that that's basically what she did. And she talked with the student, the student said, well, I'm just taking money to get the documentation. So we ruled it out that that's the way it is. I'm really glad you mentioned that. There's actually a website called dogtour.net where you can just go to the website and basically for an amount of money get a doctor's note to approve you for emotional support. So we're actually in the uh, in starting stages to update our policy. So not only do we have a policy, but we're not satisfied with it. And we're going to continue to update it because think we're continuing to learn. And we're taking some of the policies from around the state and borrowing some different practices that everybody's doing because you know usf in our state of florida is doing this good and ucf's doing that good and us doing that good so we're borrowing the best practices we're learning about as we go into this i'll give you an example one of the best practices that we're not using on our campus right now that i think will help with the issue you just brought up we are going to require that the student provide documentation from a doctor that they are seeing and that they are seeing ongoing. Okay, so this will not be a one-time, go get a doctor's note from Joe Schmo doctor, because if this student has a mental health issue that requires some type of emotional evaluation, then that should be continual. And so we're gonna request that the documentation, documentation be appropriate with that. Now you should use that carefully and think about a lot of different circumstances with, with mental health where you may be pushing the envelope a little too far with that request. Don't overdo it. Don't ever be in a situation where you couldn't explain the choices you're making. But that's an example. You know, and I'll just use the examples that come up most often, anxiety and depression. So they should be getting ongoing treatment for anxiety and depression. And so we're gonna ask them to provide that. What frequency is appropriate? You know, two weeks is overkill. But is once a semester okay? These are the types of things you have to consider and choose when you're developing a good policy. Lots of questions here. We wanna wrap up. We hope this has been useful for you in evaluating this ongoing topic that's been fun for our view. Please fill out these evaluations for us, and thank you for joining us. Thanks, Sean, for joining us. Thank you.